Ideally, you end up at a place where you understand what a funnel does and you can construct it from first principles. You don't need some template. You don't need some guru telling you like do X, then Y, then Z. You can start to think about these things from first principles. You can think about how am I going to create attention, not worried about what's going to happen after, just create the most attention. How can I capture that attention to actually stick around and pay attention to me over time? And then how can I monetize it? You are now listening to the Creative Juice podcast brought to you by Entrepreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. This is episode 306, and we're going to go back to basics a little bit today. For those of you who are new here, a refresher for those of you who are not, and maybe a deeper dive as well. I'm your host, Jack McCarthy. With me, as always, is your other host, Circa. Cirque, what's up, dude? Not a whole lot, friend. Just out here kicking it and making lessons for the indies. Yeah, there's a lot going on in uh, in indie pro. Maybe give a little update on what's going on in the community right now. It's been a minute since we've kind of done a, a little bit of a status update or a state of the union on the indie pro membership. Yeah, well, we are currently building out documentation for building in the new uh, CRM. So we're helping people build websites, helping people build funnels. And then the big project for this year is revamping the training set. So pretty much all of our trainings look a little bit long in the tooth. We've been kind of patching them up with workshops just to give updates on our different strategies. But we're going to be sort of sweeping the whole thing and providing a linear training path. So you can kind of start from step one, go to step two, go to step three for your whole music career. And so we've been building out not only the the training for the CRM and how to build websites and funnels and stuff, but we're also building out that training for sort of a linear music career marketing progression. It's super exciting. It's definitely a big initiative for the new year and something that's been kind of on the docket for us for the better part of a uh, the end of last quarter, I suppose. So I'm super excited. I know everyone in our community is is pretty stoked as well. So if you're not a member of Indie Pro, this is probably a great time to mention you should join us. It's a new year. It's 2024. If you're really looking to get your music marketing on lock and build up your business this year, join us. We'd love to have you as part of our community. We'll leave a link in the show notes if you want to check out Indie Pro and hear what some of our members are doing and see if it would be a good fit for you. We'd love to have you inside. But with that said, talking about taking your music marketing on a kind of linear journey, this is probably an interesting place to introduce today's topic and what we're going to be talking about, which is funnel building. And the reason that we wanted to bring this to the show today to talk about it here on Creative Juice is because when you're out there and you're listening to, you know, marketing people, music marketers, when you're watching YouTube and trying to learn about how to grow your audience, monetize a fan base, whatever step you might be in building your music business, you might hear this term funnel and it might automatically immediately put in your mind software or different tactics and tools and things that you can do. And, I, oh, I need to have a perfect funnel and it needs to look exactly like somebody else's. And so we wanted to kind of do a little bit of a retrace on what a funnel is, uh, not to get too uh, philosophical <laughs> about what a funnel is in business, but just to kind of give a overview from our perspective on funnel building for creative careers, whether you're an artist, a musician, in a band, uh, whatever persuasion you fit into, we want to talk about funnels and what it means to have one in your business. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today and how there are really only three pieces to any funnel. And we're going to talk about the buddy system a little bit and the different marketing strategies that fit into each part of your funnel or your fan journey. Sir, how about we kick it off? How would you define a funnel? I have a pretty firm definition in my mind, but how would you define it? Yeah, I mean, you got to think that like sales funnels started before the internet, you know, sort of marketing legends like Jay Abraham and, and folks like that just working on sort of direct mail or advertising as a means of grabbing attention, right? So grabbing attention from consumers out there 
and then getting them to actually go into a store in a lot of cases. And then the experience they have once they're in the store as all being important components of leading towards a sale. So, you know, th this is like a way to like take this very hard internet concept and, you know, break it down to its root elements and say, you know, how is this similar in a lot of other cases? So it's not just like a, a sales funnel on the internet. It's also a sales funnel out there in the physical world, but it's also like the progression of, you know, someone from being unaligned or unrelated to a concept to just bringing them, bringing them closer to it. Right. So, you know, we have funnels in human relationships. We have all sorts of different like ways to think about funnels, but I think the kind of ground floor you want to bring it down to is that Jay Abraham example of like, we need to get attention. We need to then consolidate that attention, get it to move somewhere else. And then we need to monetize that attention. Yeah, for sure. I was going to pretty much touch on everything that you just touched on, which is unsurprising since we're usually on the same page about this kind of <laughs> stuff. But in terms of a business, you can really, if, if you think about a funnel, it's really just the idea of your customer's journey from them being unaware of your business or a problem that you can solve for them to you solving it for them or providing a service or giving them a product and them liking you for it to do it again and again and again and tell other people about it. That's kind of the idea of like someone being totally unaware of you to somebody being your best friend that wants to tell everybody else about you or marrying you and, you know, putting photos on the internet of you and, and, the, and your kids or something like that in terms of human relationships. But you're right, Cirque, it's, it's interesting to mention that like funnels exist everywhere, you know businesses have hiring funnels where you're trying to attract talent I and mean, then retain talent and keep it. So funnels exist everywhere. Funnels are everything. Um, <laughs> but I think those three core concepts that Jay Abraham talks about, and I love that you mentioned Jay, one of my favorite books is Getting Everything You Can Out of All You've Got. It's an amazing book. We'll leave a link to that book in the show notes because it's so good. You should definitely read it. It's a great book. The idea of Creating attention, capturing attention, and monetizing attention are really the three stages or links in the chain of a funnel or a customer journey. And we talk about the idea of what we call the buddy system as a customer journey or a funnel for artists. And there are steps in that buddy system that really fall under each one of those attention-based categories, creating attention, capturing attention, monetizing attention. And we could talk about those. But I think what I wanted to dive into here is that the actual strategies that you use and that you see out there in the wild in music really vary from artist to artist. And there's no one definitive strategy necessarily that fits into any of those categories. And moreover, many strategies can kind of encompass each of those stages and not only that, can potentially shorten the time span of depending on who you are and what you're offering and what your fans look like it can shorten the time span that people move through those phases of attention yeah i think that like you just really want to clearly define your goals at each stage of a funnel right you can even think of like any relationship as a funnel right you can think of capturing like like when i met my wife right the goal was to capture her attention, right? Like, because I can't have a conversation with her to like express my value if she's not paying attention to me, right? You have Riz, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You gotta have some, gotta have that Riz. And so the primary goal immediately is to command attention. And if I'm focusing on like developing the relationship in that stage, then I can't be optimal at capturing attention. So it's important to like isolate those stages and know what the objective is for each stage as just an example. And that way you can maximize movement through the funnel is to really not worry about setting up the, you know, like for instance, if you are trying to capture attention from a marketplace, you don't want to be encumbered by any worry about making a sale, right? If you're worried about making a sale, when you're trying to capture attention, you're not going to do that job optimally. So maximizing movement through a funnel is about really blocking out the, the knowledge of where am I actually going in the end 
and just focusing on the part you're on right now. It's like going to a high school dance and thinking about who you're going to marry. Exactly. And people like a big way that people screw this up is we can think in music is we can think about getting people's attention is actually before them listening to your music in a way. Yes, yes. And so we're seeing this in the modern era where prioritizing the hook of content before like just not even thinking about how are we going to segue into my music. The first thing is about capturing attention on a universal level. The second thing is presenting the music. And so if you're focused on like, well, how am I going to make content that captures attention that's related to my music? Take out the music part. Just focus on the how am I going to make content to capture attention. You'll be unencumbered. And then even if the segue to your music is sloppy, it doesn't really matter. And the key example is that like Nick D podcast where he's talking about the kid who made the, you know, the video where he comes out, he brings out a sign and he says, if you're having a bad day, sit down. That was the, his idea of like, what's going to maximally get someone to stop on TikTok. In the first three seconds, I'm putting a sign out there in like a public walkway that says this thing. You're going to read the sign probably before you swipe. So once you read the sign, I want you to have to stay and see what happens, right? If we were thinking about like, well, I got these three songs. One is about this. The other's about this. The other's about this. How am I going to tie a concept to the subject matter of that song? Then now you don't have a free open space of ideas. You're limited to just ideas that segue into those songs. Yes, yes, yes. And so you're when trapped. You, yeah, you put constraints on yourself. You're shackling yeah. yourself to your music. Exactly. And the cool thing here about focusing on just the hook of the content or prioritizing the hook, rather, I don't want to say focusing only on that, prioritizing the hook of the content is, yes, it frees you in that way. It also allows you to look at the market and look at what's being done and emulate and get inspired and you do it div it's somewhat divorced of your music content or the story that you're necessarily trying to tell then you make the transition like you said and that can be as sloppy or as smooth that's where the work comes in that's where you really start putting in the brain power of like okay i've got my hook and I think that this is going to work well based on my research and what I'm seeing work well. Now let me do the work of making this transition. It's the headline, really. It's the it's the hook. Yeah. And I like that you brought this up with regards to cap uh, creating attention because really the like high high level strategies. I don't want to talk tactics even that artists use to create attention. This phase of the funnel. There's really only two. It's ads and content. And really, it's content and ads. Content then ads, in my opinion, is you, you get the content first, and then the content becomes the fuel and the targeting for your ads. Yeah, yeah. Another example I like to use, even though it's a little bit inside baseball, is just that when direct sales copywriters are writing a sales letter... They're th and they're writing a headline, which is the part that everyone will read. Some people will read the whole letter, but everyone will read the headline. And so the headline is the primary, most important piece of real estate, because how good the headline is plays a role in how what percentage of people who read the headline will actually continue reading the letter. This is where you can actually start to visualize it like a funnel, where it's like, okay, if I can make my headline or my hook good enough that a thousand people's attention goes to it, then there's a higher likelihood that more people will trickle down to read the rest, as opposed to if I write my headline so that only a hundred people look at it and care about it, then, you know, maybe you've only got 10 people reading the rest. Yeah, you could think of it kind of mathematically, right? You could think of it like a cylinder versus a funnel, right? The ideal funnel looks more like a cylinder. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I love that. Where it's like, as you go down to other levels, the hole doesn't get that much smaller. If the headline is the best it can possibly be, everyone will read the first paragraph. If the first paragraph is the best it can be, everyone will read the second paragraph. So it's just a straight shot down. Now apply this to your music. If your hook for your content is great, 
everyone will at least listen to the first 10 seconds or watch the first 10 seconds of your video. If your transition from your hook into your music is great, then people are going to watch past the 10 seconds. If your music rules, people are going to watch your whole video. Yeah. And that's all pending. Like a cylinder is great pending that everyone at the end will make a purchase or transact because if you're not filtering out people and you're just going for like, you know, sometimes it's good to repel instead of attract. So you don't want to end up in a scenario where it's a cylinder until the very end when it's like nobody, right? You want to make sure you're curating the right types of people who are going to transact at the end. But that said, like without getting too deep into the metaphor here, it's about maximizing the amount of people, the right people who end up in subsequent stages. And so, yeah, the direct sales letter example just shows you that like a great copywriter will not think about any other things they have to do in the sales letter when they're crafting the headline. They will look at the headline unencumbered from the other goals and say, what's going to get the most people to read the letter? Not what's going to communicate what I'm selling best, not what's going to pre-frame my sales arguments best. What is going to get the most people to start reading? I'll worry about pre-framing. I'll worry about selling after. But the goal here is to get the most people to start reading. Right. Really what you're trying to do is like create like a flow of people, uh, it, you know, it's something that turns on like a faucet and then you can constrain it further down the line. There's an interesting um, corollary here and so that we don't get too lost in the metaphor. I'd like to take it back to a local level and something that you can see every day on the street or on the, high, on the highway rather for this example, billboards and how businesses use them still to this day is a great example of creating attention and some businesses do a really good job of this with billboards or any kind of ads, but I'm using billboards here for the examples purpose. And here's an interesting one. When I was growing up and these billboards still exist on 95 going through Philly, there were tons of billboards for a jeweler and he would have billboards that were, I hate Steven Singer. And it was just a black billboard with white text. And it was, I hate Steven Singer or fuck Steven Singer. And I think that was, yeah, Steven Singer. And the attention that that would grab for people to then go either look, it was like the website name was there or they would look it up, I guess, back before there were websites. Um, uh, the attention that that would grab to be like, oh, that's really, I'm curious, like who hates Steven Singer and why? <laughs> and then what's happening is they're working to, that's just the creating attention part. The next step is where you know, you're working to then capture that attention. You've got their curiosity. They're going to look at something or they're going to call or find out what it is that you hate about this person or what your ad is all about. And then the next step is like, okay, once they're there and their curiosity is peaked and they're paying attention, then you capture that attention with the next thing that you're doing. And that happens with more content, believe it or not. And that's really why we talk about having a, a social media strategy, for example, for artists, and also free offers, things that then move people from just content consumption, some hanging out with you online, to getting into your DMs or winding up on your email or text list. And you do that with free offers. That's how you start to move from creating attention to then capturing attention. Yeah, for sure. And I would say that like capturing attention is... I would say like, whereas creating attention is all, a, is not worried so much about losing people, right? Like there's not really a concern about losing people. You don't have anyone yet. It's about gaining the most people. When it comes to like, when you transition into the next stages, it is more about not losing people. That starts to become a concern. And you can lose people through inactivity. You can lose people through boring people about stuff they don't care about. There's lots of ways to lose people in sort of the middle of the funnel. So, you know, inciting emotion, making sure not to bore people or belabor points or provide content that people don't care about, but also being not being inactive, not, uh, you know, you can make the mistake of not doing enough. Those would be all the things that I would do if I didn't want to retain my fans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You do, do nothing. But when you do do something, make it like stuff that nobody cares about, make it not exciting, not entertaining, not related to them at all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So 
yeah, like the re- I think the reason we're presenting these concepts in this episode is just to say that like, you know, ideally you end up at a place where you understand what a funnel does and you can construct it from first principles. You don't need some template. You don't need some guru telling you like do X, then Y, then Z. You can start to think about these things from first principles principles. You can think about how am I going to create attention, not worried about what's going to happen after, just create the most attention. How can I capture that attention to actually stick around and pay attention to me over time? And then how can I monetize it? Yeah, for sure. I think some helpful examples here before we get into the monetizing attention portion is hopefully, like Cirque said, you can start to envision how this might look for you based on just understanding these three principles, but also how you might recognize what a funnel is in the wild and where you might see it and what it, how it looks different for different kinds of artists. And, you know, some of these steps in this funnel happen rapidly one after another in one experience. For example, some artists can go and sell directly to fans that have never heard of them before or are hearing about them for the first time in an ad experience. The same thing can happen is if you've got a free offer that is really amazing, that would be super compelling to a potential new fan that's just discovering you. You might have an ad that you're running or a piece of content that you're putting out there that is like, think of this, like super compelling video, great free offer that someone who is first intrigued by the music that they hear, or rather caught by the hook that you make, intrigued by the music that you hear, and then compelled by the free offer or bribe that you're making, that could all happen in one ad or piece of content to move someone rapidly through the creating attention, capturing attention stage. And this happens all the time with all different kinds of businesses. Yeah, I mean, you can think, like you can break this concept down in an ad, right? You can say, The first thing that I see in an ad is usually either the first three seconds of video or an image or whatever the first bit of copy is, depending on what platform I'm on, right? So on Instagram Reels, it's the video or the image, like there's nothing else. But on a Facebook ad, I might read the copy before looking at the creative. Whatever the first thing I see is, that's where where you need to create attention. You need to stop the scroll. But then like the rest of the ad, the rest of the video, the rest of the copy, that's all about capturing that attention. So you, the headline got me in. I'm now stopped my scroll. I'm reading or I'm watching. What are you going to do to keep me there and keep me interested? And then you can consider the call to action, the monetizing of that attention. It's everything that happens after the like the ads message has worked on me. So you can apply this funnel concept to individual pieces of media or individual things within a larger funnel. It's very meta, yeah. It's funnels all the way down, right? So like <laughs> and and literally like you'll you'll do better cuz like an ad is probably the top of a funnel, right? It's or or the middle. It is something you're doing in the service of a larger sales funnel. But if you then apply that same concept to the piece of like the piece of collateral itself, you can do better with that individual piece. So there's lots of like ways to apply this to be more helpful. I want to give a helpful example, which is comedian Andrew Schultz. If you look at his business during the pandemic era, like 2020, it looked very much like this, where he had, you know, anywhere from nine to 12 different funnels that we could identify. But there, there wasn't a strict architecture here. He had ways to create attention like multiple, he had multiple ways to capture that attention over time and keep it there. And he had multiple ways to monetize. So on the create attention portion, he was putting out new stand-up crowd work clips every day. So he would like, you know, capture some crowd work at a stand-up show. He would cut it up into clips and crowd work clips typically do very well on social. So doing the crowd work at the show capturing it on film and then cutting it up for social media clips. That was all an effort to create attention. He also had stand up clips and podcast clips, snippets of his podcasts that also could create attention. So he had crowd work, he had straight stand up, he had podcast clips. All these clips get put out daily and any one of them has a chance to go viral and cat and create lots of attention. 
At the same time, he also had these longer form, turn your phone sideways IGTV pieces he made that typically did very well. They would get a wide distribution even to people who weren't his fans. So he had like four different pathways to create attention. Then on the capture attention side, he had a weekly live stream during the pandemic that was a talent show. So anyone could come on, display a talent, him and his podcast crew would talk about it, roast them or congratulate them or whatever. It's super good. Right. So that weekly live stream, like you saw maybe uh, an IGTV, turn your phone sideways clip. You thought this guy was funny. You followed him. Now you're seeing live notifications pop up in your notifications. He's capturing the attention he created. He also had a weekly podcast called Flagrant. So you might tune in for that instead of the live streams. So this is the second way to capture attention. And then he also was putting out those clips daily. So while if those clips went viral and got new people, they served to create attention. But even if they didn't, they were capturing attention for anyone he had already created attention from. So he's like three or four different pathways in the middle of the funnel. And then at the end, he had merch for his podcast that would monetize that attention. So if you're watching the podcast weekly, you're going to get hit with offers for merch. He had tickets to his comedy shows that would capture attention. And then he also had a Patreon. So he had like three or four different ways to get you at every stage of the funnel. He didn't say, I'm going to put out clips. I'm going to lead them to my podcast. And then from the podcast, I'm going to sell them merch. It wasn't that specific. He just created multiple opportunities to serve each job. I think that that's such a good example because it illustrates so well how while we talk about this process of a customer journey, a funnel, it can appear and be deceptively seeming to be linear when it is not. And this is a really good example of all of the elements of creating attention, capturing attention, monetizing attention that he was using. The linear nature breaks down as soon as you have more than one piece of your marketing doing more than one aspect of your funnel. Because like you said, the uh, crowd work clips could be doing great to create attention for some fans. For others, it could also just be doing enough to keep their attention and retain them. And some people might also just happen to fall into catching a friend who's watching the live streams or listening to the podcast and get introduced that way. So you start to see that this it, it becomes a little more gray area or fuzzy as you build out the marketing processes that you've got going on in your businesses. And that's a bit more advanced, but you get there quickly because you, I, in my experience, especially for artists, you realize very quickly <laughs> into getting into digital marketing that it's not a linear journey from, okay, I'm going to make it perfect. Someone's going to watch my one video that I'm going to run ads on once I know that it works. And then I'm going to get them opting into this one thing. And that's going to monetize them perfectly through this one offer. It doesn't work like that. You can start there, but it's going to break down. Or rather, to put it in a positive light, it's going to need to expand. You're going to have to expand. Then you're only possibly serving the interest of one potential kind of customer and you can't know all of the different type types of fans that you might have out there just waiting for the right thing. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So like I, I gave that example just to show you that like you're probably better off not just being unencumbered by the other stages or other things you have to do, but also being unencumbered by the path dependence, right? You, path dependence is when you depend on users in UX and in, in user experience design. Path dependence is this idea I have will only work if users take a predefined path and I'm not accounting for what if they take an alternative path. Yeah, yeah. You don't want your features to be path dependent. You want to be able to service people no matter what path they take. In this case, you don't want your funnels to be path dependent. If you can deconstruct them and provide multiple ways to create attention, multiple ways to capture attention, and multiple ways to monetize, you're probably going to be better off because people, you know, it's different strokes for different folks. That's also why you cannot necessarily assume that someone won't go out and want to buy your product immediately after finding out about you, right? 
they might not need to stick around and watch, you know, weekly live streams or your podcasts to want to, you know, grab some merch. Yeah. We call them automatic buddies. Yeah. Automatic buddies. Exactly. You know, this is an interesting point that I want to mention. What's very interesting about this is the danger of this recognition of, you know, not wanting your funnels to be path dependent, which is really important. The large majority, the vast majority of artists, st- <laughs> the default mode is that it's not having any funnels because, well, I just want to be everything for everyone. So it's interesting that you kind of have to go from, if you pay attention to what's going on in the music industry at large, even though every business has a funnel, whether it realizes it or not, what's interesting about music and artists is a lot of them are trying to be everything for everyone all the time. And they're never even getting to the point of recognition of a funnel. You kind of have to go from, all right, I got to at least try to have one path to then expand beyond it. So it's like, I have to go from trying to be everything for everyone that I can to, I need to have a path to then I I need to have the paths open back up for as many people as possible. You have to go through that journey. Yeah. hundred percent. You know, it's interesting. Something you mentioned about an ad experience and how the experience of an ad is a funnel in and of itself. When we think about copywriting frameworks, not to get too into tactics, but (laughs) <laughs> a copywriting framework like AIDA, ADA, is a funnel, <laughs> if you think about it. The idea of attention, interest, desire, action, that is a funnel. AIDA, for those of you who are new here or need a refresher, is a copywriting framework. It's the idea of you want to get attention with your copy, then you want to create interest, and then you want to build desire in your copy, and then you want to have a call to action, which takes people to the next step that they're going to take with you. And that's a funnel. It's a funnel. It's funnels all the way down, dude. Yeah. That's that. <laughs> it's so true. Well, yeah. I hope that through talking about this, we've shown you that if you've heard of the term funnel before and you you were confused on what it meant or what it represents, hopefully we've cleared that up. I also hope though that we've like prevented you from getting locked into, you know this very rigid definition of a sales funnel online and started to more think about how can I create layers of opportunities, different entrance ways and paths between these three stages. Yeah, for sure. We didn't touch too heavily on monetizing attention. Oh yeah. It kind of goes without saying a little bit, I think, but just in case it doesn't, monetizing the attention of the fans that you're you know, first creating and then capturing. That's the idea of paid offers, shocker, sales funnels, more funnels <laughs> and promotions and doing that repeatedly, having pathways for people to buy for a first time to buy from you again. And that can be for specific offers that are built around certain products that you might have. It can be for tickets to your shows. It can be for online experiences or memberships like Patreon and doing that repeatedly through things like regular sales promotions. You can do those as often as weekly, monthly, quarterly. You find a cadence that works for you and you use that to create a customer feedback loop where you're providing value to somebody. They're taking action, buying something from you. There's a transaction going on. You're over delivering on that transaction, making it feel like such an amazing experience that they're so excited about that they don't have any buyer's remorse. You know, for example, like they get a package uh, from you and it has a handwritten note, or maybe you, maybe you surprise them and sign the record that you gave them, even though they didn't order a signed version. That's a pretty dope way to over deliver just as like one quick example. And then you re nurture them. You re capture their attention, you keep it, you retain them, and then you repeat the cycle and they buy again. And that's how you create repeat customers. Yeah. We can break down the monetizing attention, like different things you might do to monetize into how we're accounting for the different types of buyers, right? So you have people who, once you do your job in these other two stages, you get attention and then you make sure to capture it or hold it over a longer term than just the first interaction. Once you're there, there will be people who just need to know what and where to buy and they will buy it. And so for that, you just need to have offers available, have an online store, have things people can participate in at a deeper level. 
So that's like the base layer, right? But then there are people who just will not buy something unless it's at a discount. Like they will not try out a product unless they're getting a deal. And in digital marketing and and, in direct marketing before it, these were known as deal seekers and are known as deal seekers or discount seekers. And so for that, you can be running regular sales promotions. You can run sales promotions on a monthly, a bi-monthly, a quarterly basis to flush out all the deal seekers from sort of the bottom of your funnel. And then you can have sort of interactive experiences that lead, like content-based experiences that lead to a specific offer. So that might be like, for instance, we have our ultimate album launch funnel where people are participating and like I probably people who sign up for an album launch funnel, they're not new. In a lot of cases, they're people who know who you are to some degree or another. And so they're signing up because they want to participate in the new thing and get some free value. And you're leading them to an exclusive offer. It's different from a sales promotion because it's not just like broadcast to everyone in your ecosystem all at once and time limited. It is like a very specific group of people who came in for the free thing and stayed for the paid thing. It's also not just like an item on your store because people can't get it except through this funnel. So you can use sales funnels that start with content and end with an offer to also convert people and monetize that attention. So we had just products on your store, things that people can buy readily available. We have quarterly or bi-monthly or monthly sales promotions, regular sales promotions throughout the year. And then we have actual conversion funnels that like start off with where they're at, they're consuming free content and end up with a specific offer. And then beyond that, you have direct customer offers, things that people who are just like hanging out in your ecosystem and haven't become a customer yet can't get access to. Specifically for the purpose of rewarding, incentivizing, and and then ascending those who have already become customers. And you can make these very exclusive and special. They're sort of like regular sales promotions, except only for your existing customers. So there's like four different ways right there to monetize attention and sort of arrange linearly in terms of when you should execute on them. Yeah, for sure. And I think leaning into the customer specific offers, that's such a good one, such a good pillar there for the, for monetizing attention, because you're monetizing the, uh, the highest level of, of attention that you have people who have already bought from you one time or more than one time already. So it gives you the greatest chances of continuing to convert them, continuing to monetize them, and the opportunity to provide, you know, the highest amount of service or value, whatever you want to call it. And you can, you know, maximize the value that you get from it as well. The transaction can kind of, it can be a nice handshake (laughs) where you're getting something great from it from a monetary perspective, which is awesome. And something else that I wanted to mention here is when it comes to the idea of using conversion funnels, sales funnels, like an ultimate album launch, for example, you mentioned, Cirque, you can hopefully see just based on the overview that we've given you guys on these three pillars of a funnel, how a content-based funnel that leads a fan to a monetization offer, you can see how that acts like a bridge that piece of your marketing acts like a bridge from capturing attention to monetizing attention, which is really cool. And when you start to think about elements or campaigns or processes in your marketing like that, and you can start to see, like it's almost like a puzzle. You can start to see like, okay, I've got this half of the puzzle. I've got this half of the puzzle and I've got this half of the puzzle. Some pieces fit nicely between the three sections and act as a bridge between them. And that's a really good example of one of them. You've got people who are hanging out, who already like you, already know you, like you said. Something like an ultimate album launch funnel or a content funnel that's then leading them to a specific offer is taking attention that you've already captured, capturing it just a bit further, just pushing them over the edge into monetization, maybe for the first time, maybe not. Maybe you're, you know, re-monetizing, recapturing, because that happens. Like you need to keep fans warm and nurtured. That's why the idea of nurturing is kind of like one of the pillars of the buddy system, one of the stages of the buddy system that spans across really all of these stages of the customer journey. Yeah. 
It's funnels all the way down, dude. Funnels all the way down. I hope you guys take away something cool from this. And if nothing more, it allows you to look at the marketing that you've been doing in potentially a new light and allows you to take it to the next step. That was kind of my big intention here with this topic was not only allowing you to think differently about what you could do with your marketing, but also recontextualize what you're currently doing to take it and make it just incrementally better in terms of how it helps you grow your music career. So I hope you guys dug this. This was fun. Hell yeah. Well, we'll catch you guys next time on Creative Juice. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. We'll see you soon. Peace, Indies. Peace.